So in last week's meditation, we had a discussion about a faith-based journey called lamenting in the Catholic tradition. And we went through a journey, a process, during the meditation at which I came to a full stop and I said, the rest of the process is yours. It is an intimate journey that you make with God or towards God or as a development or expression or exploration and surrender to faith. And in the midst of all of that, while I was demonstrating lamenting and we were meditating on lamenting, there were a whole range of different things happening. One of the biggest things that was happening was me saying the phrase, my daughter, repetitively. And as I continued that process for myself with my guides and my Lord Husband, in the privacy of my sacred space, I found that the word, and you all know how I do love the power of the word, the word that was coming up over and over and over and over again was mine. And I stopped to get a feel for the word. When Paddy came into my life, she was a birthday present to Sunali. She wasn't my dog. She became my responsibility and my relationship with her underwent a change when Sunali went off to university and Paddy and I were living with each other only. Until then, I was Paddy's granny, but she was Sunali's dog and Paddy and I would have our conversations on the side knowing that her primary relationship was with Sunali and all of that shifted and we had a one-on-one -on -one relationship then where all of Paddy's needs were being met by me and unknown to me all of my needs were being met by Paddy and that shift that change when she was no longer Sunali's dog and she was just Paddy. There was no longer this third party or this energy of somebody else actually having a primary claim on Paddy or somebody else having a primary responsibility for Paddy. That shifted and my relationship with Paddy became something new. I've never stopped to catalogue how those changes happened, but they happened and everything blossomed. She was never my dog. And the more I didn't have ownership of Paddy, the more she grew, the more she became, the more she shared. She became my god dog. She became my teacher. She became my guide. She became my everything in the end. Um, and from there, she has taught me to walk alone and she has become everything else in herself. And she might possibly be the only relationship I have had in this lifetime, on this physical plane, where she wasn't actually mine, but the relationship was so much bigger and more than I. Everybody else, from the moment I was born, that was my mother and my father. And when I was unhappy with my mother, she was Kogi's mother and Cindy's mother. Uh, and the same with my father. I went to school and that was my teacher. Everything was identified in terms of me and mine. And I didn't quite know what mine or my 
meant in terms of those relationships. We have had a series of meditations and discussions in the center about healing, about traumas, about lamenting, about connectedness, about belonging, about detachment, compassion, prayer, faith. And we've even had a discussion about what is yours on the physical plane where everything is temporary and an illusion. What is yours? We've talked about my ego and my identity and my journey. We've talked about my shifting and my becoming. Oh my, there are so many my's. So as I'm talking about this word, just this, it's, a, it's like an ordinary two-letter word. I want you to feel, just close your eyes and feel for a moment. In terms of things, when you say that is my car and that is my heart, there is one understanding of that word. And when you say, that is my child, or that is my fiancé, or that is my partner, or that is my friend, there is another understanding. And that is my body, and that is my mood, and that is my journey. There is another understanding. And what is the common thread? I am accustomed to saying what is mine is mine to protect, it is mine to nourish and mine to love, mine to watch over, mine to guide, mine to teach, mine to mentor. It is within the orbit of my accountability to the universe and my responsibility in my sacred contract. And it all sounds so wonderful on the spiritual plane. But when you stop and you think about how do I live it on the physical plane, well, oh my word, now it becomes that is mine and therefore I have ownership of it. I have control of it. I have decision-making power over it. Even as I am responsible to it and for it, it is responsible to me and for me. So think for yourself. For those of you who are single children, your mother is your mother in this lifetime and not anybody else's mother. Right? Right, Tamir? Yeah. And it is different for the children who share their mother with other children. My three sisters and I all have a very different mother. She's very different. Each of us has a completely different mother with a common thread. And not one of the three of us wants ownership of our mother, which is part of the common thread. So for you, look at the people in your life. My brother, my sister, my mother, my auntie, my uncle, my nephew, my niece, my daughter, my son, my whatever it is. Firstly, it is not yours. Did anybody give it to you? Did anybody give you ownership of it? Even my husband. My husband is not mine. Thank you. My husband seems to be everybody's. Not mine, but everybody's. So even your husband is not yours. He is everybody's. Your child is not yours, it is everybody's. It is not yours. Now this is a difficult thing for most people. It is not yours. You do not have ownership of anything that you describe as my whatever. Even when you are responsible for it, and you are nurturing it and you are guiding it. It is not yours. You are merely serving a purpose. You are merely an act of service. A contract that is unfolding beyond your scope, beyond your knowledge, beyond your understanding. 
it is still not yours. You cannot give it back because it wasn't yours in the first place. You cannot surrender it. It wasn't yours in the first place. What you can do is liberate it in your consciousness where you have taken ownership of it and entangled it in yourself as part of who you are and your identity. When I go places and people meet me, some of them meet me as Paddy's granny, some of them meet me as my mother's daughter, some of them meet me as clients, friends, whatever, they all have a different role and I struggle, very often struggle, to be the same person everywhere. And most of them, after 16 years of living in the center, know what it is I do every day in my life and I very often get the question, so is your daughter as intuitive or as psychic or as spiritual as you are, whatever the word, and I say, I don't know. And they say, oh, or if I say yes, they go, oh, that's like so normal, that's so natural, you know. Of course she should be like you. Because she's yours. Because she came through you. Because she's lived with you. So of course she should be like you. And then similarly, when people say to me, oh, you know, are you like your mother? Is this, is your mother just like you? Are you, did you inherit this from your mother? And I say, no, my mother is not in the least bit intuitive or psychic or spiritual. They look at me and they go, how come? Now that's unnatural for them. And when I look at continuity, which I have taught in the center, I see the thread that links everything together. But being chosen or choosing, being chosen as the one to whom others are born, or choosing to be born to others gives us connectedness. It gives us continuity. It doesn't make us the terrible twins. It doesn't make us identical. Just because one person is like this doesn't mean everybody else who comes from there or is passing through there actually needs to be the same. And yet in our minds, we think mine and then everything that is mine must be the same. So my daughter on the one side and my mother on the other side should be very much like me, if not the same. I look at mothers who dress their children alike, or mothers and children who dress alike. You know, same, same, but different. We all want to be same, same, but different. And then we all want to be different and special. And it all comes back to that system of ownership versus Belonging, ownership is, it is mine, I own it, I have authority over it, I have decision making power over it. Ownership is the ego game. Belonging is the connectedness, we're in this together. So here we are married in the ego game and here we are partners in the spiritual game. When people get married, their relationship changes. They now have ownership of each other because they signed a document that says till death do us part. And I heard this comedian on Facebook saying, it's okay if you fight with your wife today, you will have the rest of your life to win her back. Why? Because you're married. Everything gets easier when you're married. You don't have to get all dressed up because she'll still be there tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. So this ownership helps us to take each other for granted. This ownership says, I will have the next day and the next day and the next day to forgive you. And I will have the next day and the next day and the next day to change my behavior. And I will have all of those other moments because you are going to be here forever in order to become a better person. And why do I need to become a better person for you when I have ownership of you? 
this over-identification with that label that we have put on those people. And that's what the my word does. It puts a label on people. It is mine. My boyfriend, so he should behave like this. Well, I'm sorry, but you know what? I want to make a rule that says my fiancé should behave like that, right? What a lovely rule it would be. Mine, it should do this. It's mine, it should do that. My so-and-so never behaves like that. I don't allow it. It's mine, so it's supposed to be. It should be. It must be. Idealistically, like that. Because it is mine. Give it up now, it's not yours. And then, of course, once we've put that label, it's my something, after the word my, whatever the rest of the label says, there's a whole new job description. So it's my boyfriend, he'll behave like that. It's my fiancé, it'll behave like that. It's my husband, it'll behave like that. How it went, the job description went from boyfriend to husband, and it evolves with new additions. This is not a promotion. This poor man is not getting promoted. If you make change the gender, this poor woman is not getting promoted. All that's happening is that the ownership is getting more intense. The rules are getting more variable and uncertain. So all of us were children once. We were somebody's son or daughter and your parents said, my son, my daughter, there were rules, there were regulations. My son doesn't play with dolls, he plays with guns. My son doesn't play the piano, that's for girls. See, gender biases. My daughter doesn't talk to those people and those people and those people because those people are like that and like that and like that. Because it is my daughter, they don't talk to those people. Discrimination, prejudices. We learn all of this because we are somebody something. Not you, somebody something. And so you are still somebody something. And you are making everybody else your something. Even when they are not yours. And in making everybody your something or the other, you are making rules for them. You are creating discriminations and judgments around them. You are giving them a job description and they don't know what the job description is. So here's an example I want you to think about. And it's a personal one as usual because I have lived it. Pascal and I had this discussion and I said to him, dearest, if you are busy with that and you forget that I exist and in that moment you are behaving disrespectfully or disloyally to me, then you are giving me permission to do the same to you. So if you go there with that person and I disagree with that but you do it anyway, then you are giving me permission to date somebody else. And of course, Pascal was horrified. He said, I don't understand that. And it wasn't a bad connection. It's not because we were speaking two different languages. He really met. I don't understand that. We just got engaged. It's not even a month. And this woman is talking about dating somebody else. I can go on a date with somebody else. If you go there with that person. And he said, oh, but that's my. And I said, ah, hold on. That's your whatever is a label. That's the label you put on that relationship. And when I say I'm going to go on a date with somebody else, that's the label you put on this relationship. But if you go to dinner there and you are disrespectful of me and disloyal to me there and I go to dinner here and I am disrespectful and disloyal to you in my choice, whatever the label, Set the label aside and come back to the behavior. It is the same behavior. I don't care what the label is. 
the behavior beyond the label speaks to who I am. It flows into my energy field. It flows into the contract between us. So my this and my that and my the other is the label. Get rid of the label. It is not yours to begin with. Even the label is an illusion. It is a maya of your mind in order to control something other than yourself. So your relationship with God, you know, my God, and your relationship with your partner, you know, my partner, and your relationship with your mother or your father or your son or your daughter or anybody else has a label with a job description and that job description creates a whole range of behaviors that you replicate everywhere with different attitudes making yourself the chameleon on the smarty box same person different behaviors ruled by the job description ruled by the label ruled by the ownership that you created in your head for yourself this is too much hard work. Can you just stop now? Throw out all the labels, throw out all the ownership and be you. Go manage you. Go manage your job description. What is your job description? To love and be loved. One phrase, one sentence, two verbs. Same action, same behavior, same feeling, same outcome. To love and be loved. That's it. I like this job description. It suits me well. Everything else is a figment of your imagination and your desire for control. So hard to give up the labels. Expectation. If we're in this relationship or that relationship or that relationship regardless of the label you should have the same behaviors. It's called being in integrity with yourself. The same behaviors, the same boundaries, the same attitudes, the same loving energy the same respect for yourself and others. Same, same. Not different. But if the label is determining the behavior, and if the label is determining the attitude, and the label is determining the expectations, then you need to throw out the label. And come back to your job description and manage you. There is nobody else that requires as much management in every relationship you are having as you do. So, I said to Paddy, we're having this Yabba Dabba Do togetherness weekend and I would very much like it if she held the space. As usual, Paddy was very agreeable and I said, we're going to have hopefully a few God dogs here. And Paddy said that she thought that was a brilliant plan and she likes to have the company, etc. And then she said, are they going to sleep in my bed, Granny? And I said, Paddy, you no longer have a bed on the physical plane. You no longer have a bed in the center. And she was very upset for a moment because, you know, her bed. Labradors love to sleep. It was her bed. And I said, I've transformed your bed. It is now a series of meditation couches in the corridor and in the meditation room. Your bed is serving another purpose now. It is no longer your bed. And for a split second there, the Paddy, who was Paddy here, went into, I want my bed. 
And then the paddy, who is Sirius God's dog, you know, Shiva girl, said, oh, wonderful granny. It's not my bed, but my bed has become more. It is in service to others. And that's what happens when it's no longer yours. It becomes more. It becomes more than itself. It becomes more than yours. It becomes ours, everybody's, the universe's. More importantly, you become more. When you are owning everybody in your life, when you are determining them with labels, you are imprisoning yourself to the same label. And those labels are determining how you behave. You are so busy policing everybody you own. That you are feeling unsafe. And this is what happens on the physical plane. Everybody who comes here says, oh, How do you sleep with all these windows open? Aren't you scared? Do you see these windows? They can be broken. If I close them, they'll get broken if somebody wants to break in. If I leave them open, at least they'll still be whole when the break-in is done. Makes complete sense to me. I have stained glass windows. You break it, they're irreplaceable. Rather walk in and pick up what is there instead of breaking the windows to get in. Because if really somebody wants to get in, they'll break the windows and get in, no? Common sense. What do I value more? The window, hole, leave it open. You live here alone, aren't you afraid? Of what? What can you possibly steal from here that I will need when I go home? What is irreplaceable? Even this lifetime is replaceable. I will have another one if I need it. I can even have nine more if I need it. I can line them up for you tomorrow. What is irreplaceable? Pascal put a beautiful ring on my finger and my friend said, my beautician today, said, oh, I hope you're not wearing that everywhere you go. Maybe you should wear it at home only. Why? If I leave it at home, how will I enjoy it? Where will I leave it at home? Because at home you tell me somebody will come through my window. Should I put it in the safe now? And then take it out for special occasions? Because I am afraid to lose it? If you have something, are you going to live in fear of losing it? Why? Because you own it? The minute you own something, you must be afraid to lose it. Rather you should lose your ownership now and liberate yourself from the fear of losing it. See ownership, job description, purpose, service to you. Ownership, it becomes part of your identity. If you lose it, you will become less. Rather you should lose the fear and the ownership simultaneously now. Don't own it. Do you really think that you have it? I don't have a house. I work really hard with this house. I work harder for the house than it does for me. Who has who? The house has me. Even when I leave it, I have to leave somebody to take care of it, no? So the house has me. You don't have ownership of anything. If you are washing your car every week and putting petrol in it and running around in it, it owns you. But we have all sorts of security systems because we are afraid to lose it. We all have stuff. And the more you have, the more fear you have of losing it. Even as you are acquiring it, you are afraid to lose it. Acquire a boyfriend, afraid to lose it. So I put protection on myself, all these barriers to make sure I don't lose it. And what do I do? I lose it. 
And where do you lose it first? Inside. Inside. Where you lose sight of yourself. And you lose management of yourself. And you lose your job description. Too busy policing and owning to see yourself clearly. So you lose sight of yourself. You lose your intention. You lose your vision. You lose your abundance. You lose your faith. You lose everything that you came here with. Naturally, all the stuff that actually, from a soul perspective, can never be lost. But you lose sight of it, so it is lost. And you go to fear instead. Why did you get it in the first place? Why did you own it in the first place? Huh. Whole other drama, that one. You think you got it. You had to own it. You had to acquire it. You had to take ownership of it. Because your identity as soul wasn't enough. The ego identity said, I need to fill here and fill there and fill there and fill there. And so I had to fill it all up. And now I have a collection of everything. And I have to pay for it and I have to dust it and clean it and it owns me. So be careful of ownership. What you own, owns you. What you are controlling, controls you. What you are imprisoning, imprisons you. Spiritual law, as within, so without, as above, so below. Live the as above first. The universe owns nothing. It is nothing. There is nothing to own in it. Even the relationship with God, there's no ownership in it. I cannot own my relationship with God. It is a fluctuating, flowing, energetic system, dynamic. I cannot even own my thoughts because I don't know what those are. Do you know how many thoughts I have that go unheeded? And if somebody in the universe was brave enough to record every thought I have and present it to me, I'd say, oh, didn't know, didn't know, didn't know, oh, got that one, didn't know. Most of them would be a didn't know. I can't take ownership of what I don't know. I can't take ownership of what I am ignorant of. So I would say it's not my thoughts, and yet my brain was thinking it anyway. My mental body was agitating with that one and skipping over here and going over there and generally having a ruckus in the universe with all of my thoughts. But I have no ownership of them. Can't own my thoughts. Can't own my emotions either, because how many of us are just in denial about those? So all of the stuff that's happening inside, I have no ownership of. Don't have ownership of my relationship with God. Don't have ownership of my thoughts. Don't have ownership of my emotions. When are you going to have ownership of yourself? You don't even have ownership of your physical body. It is going to die and get disposed of. And you want to own somebody outside of you? You want to own stuff that you leave behind? You want to determine how the stuff you own and the people you own will behave and how they will become and how they will treat you? This is too much work. That was my mosquito. It's too much work. Let us simplify. Just simplify. The stuff that you own is temporary. Right now you have use of it. You have responsibility for it. Make it mutual. The people that you own, that is a lie. You cannot own another soul. Even God doesn't own that soul. So surrender that thought once and for all. And when you stop thinking of each and every relationship as my this and my that, practice people, every day, every moment practice, You will give it room to become, to be itself. You will be practicing acceptance. You will be practicing loving. You might even be practicing respect for yourself and others. Let 
And then of course there's my job. My job. Again, now that job comes with a job description. It comes with responsibility, but it's my job and it must be done like that and done like that and done like that because I am meeting somebody's expectations, usually mine, which are worse than everybody else's. My job. I am my own biggest cricket. critic, right? Yeah. We know these games. So here, in our unconsciousness, we keep playing them. In our subconsciousness and in our consciousness, is where we need to change them. We need to eradicate the word my from all of our descriptions of others, especially other living beings. Nations have said, that is our ocean. This is our airspace. So they think all the fish in that ocean or that part of the ocean is theirs. They can do with it as they please. They can sell it to a whole other nation. Yeah? This is what ownership does. It divides. And in creating division, it creates fear. In creating division, it creates agitation. It creates a lack of everything that we call abundance consciousness. I'm just waiting for all that to sink in because I've been talking such a lot. Talking too much. <clears throat> and then there is the notion of my universe. Now, I'm at a stage in my life where my universe is my universe, your universe is your universe. I seem to live off the planet most of the time in my universe. And everybody's universe seems to have a different relationship with the same planet that we're all living on. We are all living on the planet Earth, but we all have a different relationship with it and how we impact on it. Everybody has their own notions, their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own emotions. Their own. Everybody is different. It's wonderful. Variety is awesome. So my universe is different. It's separate from your universe and it's connected to your universe. It's all one universe in the end. I try to make sense of this every day and I struggle with it on some days. On other days it makes complete sense to me that my universe and your universe are the same universe. So I have had to consciously choose that it is all Shiv's universe and I am in Shiv's universe. And within Shiv's universe, there is what I think of as my universe because I don't know what's going on everywhere else. There is more going on that I don't know and that Shiv knows. So I've aligned my universe with his so that whatever he knows, it will work for me too. I have no other way. I'm at a complete loss about how to deal with the vast nothingness of the universe in the smallness of this life. And then my Lord Husband said something very interesting to me. We've talked about this in this Thursday group. The binary number system. He said when there is a flow of energy from zero to one, that flow of energy doesn't know that it will find one. It is when it connects with the one that it has the experience and the realization that there is one and it calls it one to differentiate it from the zero. Otherwise it is zero connecting to zero. My Lord Husband is very clever. He explains things perfectly in my head. I don't know if I explained it as perfectly for you. 
But any connection that goes from 0 to 1 in the binary number system doesn't know that it is 0 and 1. It is only connecting to itself. For differentiation purposes, we say 0 and 1. We say the dog star has two stars. It's a binary system, star system. The connection between the two, they do not know that they are separate. They are one. When the energy returns from one to zero, it is not merely a reaction of zero to one. We don't know if they are connecting simultaneously like everything else in the universe does the law of mutuality mean that zero and one are connecting simultaneously? It is not zero to one and then one to zero. It is zero to zero all the time. One to one all the time. Same, same, but different. <clears throat> so my universe, your universe, same thing. Zero to one, zero to zero, one to one. And if that confused you, well, sit with it for a while. Wrap it around your mind. Wrap your mind around it. Same, same, but different. These are all the dynamics of the universe. Where everything is coming and going. When we see it from the duality. Here, on this plane where we divide things, we separate things to make sense of them, we differentiate them to make sense of them. And then we take ownership of this and negate that. We take ownership of this and go into desire and need and fear and we forget who we are. In differentiating this way, we separate ourselves. We must stop differentiating. There are so many things that we must stop doing. So instead of stopping all of that, let's just start something. Let's just start living the job description. This job description. I am here to love and be loved. That's all. Nothing else. No qualifying statement. I am here to love and be loved. If love becomes expressed as service, beautiful, brilliant, wonderful, blessed. If love becomes expressed as silence, beautiful, wonderful, enjoy it. Any high vibrational tone or word description you require to go with that word love works. High vibrational meaning beyond your heart center, from the wisdom and the insight of your third eye, from the truth of your throat, from your connectedness with the divine in your crown, from there high vibrational, if it's coming from below your heart center, low vibrational, ego, human doing, not soul being, and that's just in the duality. Re-establish your connectedness and your belonging. Re-establish the simplicity of your job description. Reconnect to soul's purpose. You have ownership of nothing. And until you have ownership of nothing, the no-thingness cannot embrace you, uplift you, engage you in that Oneness of zero to zero, one to one. So much of our lamenting, which is where we started this discussion, so much of our lamenting is because it is mine. By the time I finish this entire process of lamenting, of journeying with my faith into a bigger and bigger dimension of understanding and loving, I have come away knowing that there is a soul in this universe that I travel with 
exactly the way I travel with Paddy. One louder than the other, no doubt, but the same. It is not mine. They are both Shiva girls. They are both lights in the universe. Like that binary Sirius star system, they shine and they call me to them wherever they are, however they are. My job description is simple. To love and be loved. When I am missing it, when I think it is gone from me, I am not receiving its caring. I am focused on weeping for what is not mine. What is never mine, wasn't mine to begin with. And there is peace. There is peace in knowing that it is same, same. Zero to zero, one to one. There is joy. And there is belonging. There is connectedness. And just to prove it, I know exactly where my daughter is now. I can find her in the different cities. I can track and trace her just by following love. Couldn't do that before when it was mine. See, I still say my daughter, no? You all know what I mean. It's an identification now. In future, I will say Sunali, the other Shiva girl. Then you'll all know who I'm talking about. That other soulmate. There is peace. And there is liberation. I am liberated. I am no longer burdened with being a bad mother, with not following the job description. I am no longer burdened by what is not possible and what may be possible. I am liberated from all of those prisons of my mind. And there is joy. There is joy in feeling connected. So I pushed my luck. And I said, Lord Husband, I want to know that I have fulfilled this. And he crossed his arms and he said, hmm, Must you know everything? Eh, I'm like that. Okay, the nature of the beast is the nature of the beast. Hold out my iPad. Went up to Aishin and said, give me a card. And you know, the last time I did this, where I said, show me who I am, it showed me the very first, the very first card in the Aishin, which is called Creative Heaven. And it is the three lines on Shiv's forehead, which is the Tripura symbol, which is now on my arm. I didn't know all that then. He had to teach me. I've learned. And this time, it is the very last card. I've never seen it before. I don't even remember what it looks like. I know it is number 64. And the very last card of the I Ching is not an end. It is a new beginning. Now imagine that. One of the wisest oracles in our time, in the history of mankind, says when you have reached the end, you have reached a new beginning. Lao Tzu. In completing one thing, you have already begun another. There is no end. There is no end. When you surrender what you think you own here, the flow shifts. Something unfolds somewhere where you can't see it. And something begins anew. What you've been holding on to in your ego might end. But something else is birthed, begins anew. It blossoms. It grows beyond your ken. 
and everything unfolds exactly as it should. And when you meet yourself on that unfolding pathway, you will love what you created. You will love what you became. And you will have lived to love and be loved. I sound like I'm making a promise. I give you my word. I give you their word. Let us meditate.